Ustamia, while conlanging is very athletic, is an SLV language. I always have to do the stretches. And third person singular, stay limber, focus and topic and definiteness, stay hydrated. If you're joining us now on YouTube, welcome, welcome all the people from YouTube in the future watching this, sitting on couches, beds, in the subway, I don't know. Wherever you're watching it, welcome. Um, this is number, some number, we don't know what number it is, it's up there, uh, in the uh, Conlang With Me Season 1 uh, series where we're working on the call language family. And today we have a very, very special, special treat if you can call it that, uh, which is that we are going to be starting on the grammar. We're going to actually be starting on writing a, a reference grammar of, uh, of the call language family. And I think we don't even need to, uh, to wait too much longer before we just jump right in and look at, where is it? The everything. <laughs> uh, I think I'll probably change this over to here and change this over to here. Um, so we have the comparative grammar of the call languages with special attention paid to the variety spoken in the Ustamia region. And the joke here is I, I almost want this to be like an in-world grammar. Um, so I want it to be written by some fictional linguist and I want it to be referencing some kind of fictitious tradition of scholarship and you know maybe they get into like theoretical debates with people who don't exist. Um, I, want, I want there to be like Borges vibes to this whole thing. Um, since we haven't done a ton of con worlding yet, I'm going to um, I'm going to pull a Tolkien and I'm going to um, translate this person's name into something that is evocative for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this, uh, the author of this, Cornelius Q. Spratt. Um, um, and it's, Cornelius Q. Spratt is going to be kind of like this uh, almost Victorian, um, this Victorian linguist uh, who's taken it upon himself to write this this grammar and so I hope we can have a little bit of fun with with uh, with the sort of style of uh, scholarship uh, from from the the very late um, very late 19th century because it's a good amount of fun okay by Cornelius Q Spratt um, and then lots of usually they have in these Victorian um, books they always list all the degrees and there are lots of them um, but we're not going to do that because I think that would require too much con worlding. So without further ado, let's let's take a look. So I've made a little bit of a um, an outline and I've taken the um, if any of you are familiar with the book describing morphosyntax by uh, Payne, um, I don't remember the exact citation. Uh, Payne describing morphosyntax. You can uh, look that up, or many of you may already know because it's often talked about in conlang world. Um, it has a really nice guide uh, for sections um, for field linguists to break up a grammar into. And so it starts off with uh, demographic and ethnographic information. Uh, they don't, uh, he doesn't spend any time on uh, phonology, so, uh, but we will. So I put that in. There's also morphological typology, uh, grammatical categories, constituent order typology, all sorts of things. So these are things that we've been talking about. We'll sort of slot our um, information into this structure and, and gradually kind of make it, you know, cool and hopefully informative. And so away we go. So let's take a look at what we've decided about the grammar of this on this language. So so this is going to be a comparative grammar. I'll go back up here. A comparative grammar. So it's going to um, treat the various call languages together. 
and showing where where and in what ways they differ. Um, but it's going to take Eustamia as the kind of reference. Uh, and this is a kind of uh, a kind of grammar that you don't see a ton of these days, but it was definitely more common back in the heyday of um, of the sort of um, comparative and historical uh, linguistics that was going on in the 19th century. And so I thought, cool, we can sort of use that. And um, let's start with let's start with word order. I think that's an easy place to start. So we want to go to constituent order typology, constituent order main clauses. So this is where we're going to talk about whether the language is SOV, SVO, VSO, etc. Um, we are looking at a language that is, if we bring up our text, you know, we're going to need a zoom, I think, here. Um, we're looking at an SOV language that's uh, got some that's got some qualities that are are not entirely typical of of SOV. Um, so it's it's a sort of a mixed constituent order uh, language, but it is SOV. And so let's find a very, fairly simple sentence that we can use as the example. Um, do we have anything transitive here? Okay. Um, Realize there's a little bit more work to do here, so we won't use that sentence. Uh, okay, so here's a good one. He left his home. So, Eustamia call is an SOV language. Yes, we are going to try uh, our best to write it in a I'll say mildly 19th century style, um, not too extreme, and it may uh, strain the abilities of my uh, of my compositional skills to do so. But you know, where we can add in a little bit of that can be fun. Um, but I think first we're just going to write it quite plainly, and then we can embellish as we go. So, so we have. The one thing we're not going to do is use 19th century style uh, example sentences uh, and the method of presenting data. I think I would like to use something a bit more contemporary for that. Um, and forgive me if I am not the best at, oh, okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm not the best at all the controls here. I usually do this in LaTeX. That might sound like a brag and it is. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm kind of slightly afraid of, of Google Docs, but I'll be fine, right? Right? Um, so here we have, uh, home. He left his home. So here we have a nice example sentence. Actually, it's not a full sentence in the in the source. So we'll we'll be good and we will we'll leave it there and we should cite where this came from. We might come up with a list of abbreviations for these texts later. Um, okay. Good. So that's our first example sentence. That was relatively painless. Um, okay, so Eustemia calls an SOV language. Uh, that's good enough for there. Let's Let's keep going. In the verb phrase. Do we have anything interesting to say? Do we have any 
adverbial elements that we can use as evidence here. Um, this is this will go. This will go nicely. Um, we have. Oh, is it going to make me do? Uh, it's not going to do numbering for me. Oh, okay, it is. Cool. Okay, so. And third person singular. Already past good complementizer past learn. So this shows us that already and words like it to be determined what those are, um, precede the verb. Or at least this kind of state of verb, like to be good. Sufa. Suva, rather. Um, Adverbs of time, and we may want to generalize this to all adverbs, um, precede the uh, verb, or if we want to be more indirect, the verbal element. <laughs> That's obnoxious. We can just call this hoska. Fakuli susufa Where are we in example in the following example I'm not gonna Okay. Alright, so we're starting to uh, to get things nailed down. What else do we need what else can we put in? Um we know that we don't know anything about question words. We don't know any. Ah, we we do have a kind of comparative here because her feathers were as white as the sun. So we can put this in, and we can just okay. That already knows that it's continuing the numbering. Excuse me. Oh no. See, the problem is I can't see anything because this microphone, so I'm kind of guessing where all the, the buttons are, and I'm not that good of a touch typer. I'm, I'm okay. I'm not that good. So third person singular, plural feather. Oh, we can just copy this, I think. No need to spend too long on this. Because her feathers were as, oops, were as white as the sun. Perfect. And this is also from Hoska. So I'm imagining that Cornelius Q. Spratt went among the Ustamia people, spent a number of years there, um, collected various uh, folk tales, and um, one of them is this Hoska Papayawi. And actually, I believe the stress is Hoska Papayawi. Must be, must be mindful of these things. And what does this tell us? Um, this tells us that the standard of comparison dun, 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 precedes, the, um, precedes the, the comparative. It's not really, well, it is kind of a comparative. It's an equative, I think you would call it. Um, so the standard of comparison precedes the 
um, what's the name for that? Precedes the stative verb. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, this is all going to get fleshed out and made a lot nicer, but I think we just need to start somewhere. A question here is the fable that um, that we've translated was it chosen because it it exhibits any interesting properties or is it just random? It was more or less at random. Um, the thing is that the longer the text you you choose, the more likely you're just going to find basically everything in it, and that's pretty helpful. Um, that said, certain genres of text show you different kinds of things. And folk tales are nice because they tell a story. You can start to see how sentences, um, you can start to see how information is managed throughout the narrative. So things are introduced, then they're referred back to, and top, a topic is changed when something new comes up. And so you can see how things like um, focus and topic and definiteness all work in the language, if indeed those things are, are marked grammatically. And so you can you also get a chance to see things like discourse particles, um, things like anyway and um, oh by the way and th these kinds of things. So these connected narratives are often really great for um, for documentation. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So anything else? I think I saw something go by, but it, I don't know that I didn't quite catch it. Um, hopefully it will show up on my little console here so I can read it uh, a little bit better. It's a bit hard sometimes, I think, to read the, the chat over the, the, the white background. That's unfortunate. Um, okay, so what else can we do? We can... We have a lot of morphological stuff going on. Um, this is more more kind of word order related stuff. What do, what do we have within the noun phrase? So in the noun phrase we have something like, do we have anything interesting in the noun phrase? Ah, well we have the relative clause preceding the noun. I saw something about night mode. Google Docs does not have night mode, and I this is like a perennial problem in my life. I really, really detest looking at bright lights on screens basically at any time of day, and so I apologize that that uh, we don't have access to to uh, a dark mode for this um, for this because yeah, I would be able to to watch this at night, um, no question. If anyone does know of a uh, of a an alternative uh, or a way to activate uh, dark mode on Google Docs, I would be very very happy to hear it, because um, that would make my my life a lot easier when I'm reviewing these. You know, looking for the things that I want to link to. You know, the the bright white light pours its way into my eyeballs. Um, relative clause. Uh, the relative clause proceeds. Eh, relative clauses proceed. Um, the noun. What's a good example? Um, something like this one. A fool. An idea came to the foolish bird. Let's just bring all of this over. So here we have snaku. Snakutsi kuli. Foolish relative bird. This proves that relative clauses precede the noun. Um, actually, maybe I should do this. An idea came to the foolish bird. This poor bird. So uh, maligned in this fairy tale. I don't know what it is. I'll have to have a talk to with uh, Cornelius about this. An 
And I see that we are, so I've been originally planning to do these, you know, two one hour streams per week to, uh, I don't know, to just sort of have things available on more days so that people can uh, have an easier time seeing things. And uh, I always tend to go over when I, uh, <laughs> when I have the chance, when I'm given the opportunity. So uh, thank you for sticking around with me. Um, we can maybe do a little bit more here, maybe uh, 10, 15 more minutes and try and get some, try and get some headway on this, on this grammar. Um, actually, I think what we should do, we've got some decent, uh, got some decent examples here. We can talk about the diachronic aspect. And let's talk about, let's look at the proto-language text. Because this is slightly different. Um, so Yuslami Akal is an SOV language. Uh, the as has also been reconstructed for proto protocol uh, is an SOV language. Um, a state of affairs, which has also been reconstructed for protocol. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. Adverbs of time precede the verb element. This is also, I believe, true in the in the proto language. Relative clauses precede the noun. Um, yeah, nothing too interesting going on here in terms of in terms of constituent order, so maybe we can move on because that's kind of boring. Um, what else do we have? Adverbs, manner. We have a time adverb that we know. Um, selection of the time adverbs in Eustamia is given below, and then we will have some sort of thing that includes faculty already. And then what we could do whenever we give a, a form, we can put in the proto form as well. Nope. Okay. Yeah, spell tech's gonna have a a fun time with this. Um, all right. All right. What else do we have? Ah, this kuna fetu, which is kuna vidi, I believe in Eustamia, so, um, all day long. So just this section of the grammar will give some representative uh, adverbs. Yeah, so kunavidi from, uh, what is it? From kunafetu. Literally night, day. Interesting. Okay, so that's good. I don't think we have any others, do we? Do we? No. Okay. Anything else interesting? Find us some texts. Mm. No, okay, so let's just keep going. Descriptive adjectives. Um, so one thing that's interesting, one thing that's interesting, and, and we, could, we could use this, often a language will have adjectives that are either, and here are some technical terms coming at you, noun-y or verb -y. 
So the adjectives will act kind of like nouns or kind of like verbs, depending on the language. And you stop me a call and all the other call languages um, is, uh, is a verby adjective language. So instead of having adjectives like English, he is smart, um, you'd have a state of verb, something like he smarts, meaning is an, or he intelligence. Um, so this is how, how it works in Eustamia call. You can see that we have good is a verb and it inflects for tense, just like any other verb would. Um, so we have this, these kinds of state of verbs here. So the, um, so adjectives, adjectival meanings are expressed, um, using stative verbs e.g. sufa to be good um, ed. what's interesting though in these languages where you have um, you uh, where you have um, what's it called uh, verby adjectives sometimes you have a subset of adjectives that work kind of differently Actually, this is true of, of, of all languages. There are often a subset of adjectives that work differently, and they often are words like big, old, bad, good, um, these kinds of things. And there's a, a, a small subset of adjectives that, that work differently than others, so we can maybe play with that a bit. Um, I don't think we have any non-numeral quantifiers. I don't think we have any numerals. Um, pronouns. Yeah, okay, so we do have some pronouns. The pronoun system of Yustamia call um, has innovated um, or is innovative. Yeah, is innovative is an innovative one. The third person singular um, pronoun lu is an example um, it can be reconstructed back to a protocol form and what was it in protocol I feel like we have some notes on this Yeah, so a protocol form low we'll probably bold that too. Um, which which was a demonstrative. A demonstrative. which was a demonstrative pronoun, uh, the proto-call third-person pronoun. And what was that? Ah, so. does not survive into Eustamia. So that's interesting. Okay. And maybe we should mark that it's uh, the indeclinable third person Singular pronoun lu is an example. It can be reconstructed to a protocol form lo, which was a demonstrative pronoun. Um, blah, blah, blah. The protocol third person. Yeah, okay. I probably don't need to read it out loud. Um, good. Moving on. So this is the very first section is where we can kind of have some fun. So genetic affiliation. Um, the call family is um, relatively wide, 
uh, it's relatively diverse with um, containing at least, mm, we're going to have more than four. We have four um, widely spoken languages. Um, let's say the call family is relatively widespread rather than diverse. Um, Ustamia, which is spoken in the uh, fragrant coast region, um, is the most widely spoken. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We can change this later. But other call languages can be found from wherever to wherever. Um, as for the hmm, as for the relationship between the call languages and other families, many proposals have many proposals have been advanced, but none has yet been. Prove it. Cool. Uh, something like that. So we're going to need to do some more world building, I think, before we can fill in too much of this. Um, but this is uh, actually this should probably go into demography. Yeah. Okay. Cornelius Q. Spratt, you have a lot of work cut out for you. You're, you're, you're climbing a mountain, Cornelius, and it's going to be tough. It's gonna, there are going to be days where you're going to wonder why you did it. There are going to be nights where you stay up obsessing over some particle or some suffix. And I just want you to know, you're doing it for a good reason, for a good cause. You are documenting the call languages. You are going to make the, the, the canonical source. You are going to be the only one who... Uh, who whose name will go down in, in history um, as, as a great, uh, albeit fictional linguist. So take, take, uh, take heart in that, Cornelius. Take heart. I think I should probably uh, call it a day here because I am getting a bit, um, a bit tired. A bit tired. Writing grammar is, it's not, uh, it's not easy work. It's not light by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the full screen and I'll, I'll, I'll have a little chat with you before I go. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining along. And, you know, I know grammar writing can sometimes be uh, a chore, but it's something that we have to do. And it's something that I want to show a little bit of the process of, um, especially this the fact that it's all kind of centered around finding the evidence in the texts, coming in, making the generalizations around that, and referring back to the to the uh, evidence, which are, come in the form of these uh, example sentences. So hopefully that is at least somewhat helpful, or at least some tiny bit interesting. And we will come back uh, next week on Tuesday, and we will do some more. I'm not sure exactly when is going to be call day and when's going to be our other language day. Um, we also need some names for the other languages. We have one for Eustamia. We need other names. So we've got a lot of work cut out for us. Um, it's not just Cornelius that's going to have to do the work. We're all going to have to pitch in a little bit. Um, but yes, if you enjoyed this, viewers on YouTube in the future, um, please, I would appreciate uh, your joining us again. Subscribe so that you will find out when that is. You know, Go up to the top of that mountain and find that bell and that ad abandoned temple and, and, and ring that bell so that you can, you can be notified um, when a new thing comes up. And I think that's it. I think that's everything. So we'll see you next time.